Welcome, friends! It's Camden. For those of you who don't know me, I just graduated from Yale with a degree in East Asian Studies. I'm currently in Miami, hence the little bedroom scenery change. But I spent the last few days researching, studying, watching YouTube videos about the college admissions process. And I feel like a lot of the other young, hip YouTubers are getting it half right. They talk a ton about grades, extracurriculars, essays, you know, the huge. Today, I wanna to talk about some of those topics they've mentioned, elaborate upon them further, as well as address some other concepts that I've learned over the past four years as a college consultant. I'll be covering some of the more spicier topics, such as legacy, intended major, even your sexual orientation. <laughs> I already know this is gonna be a hella long video, so feel free to watch in one and a half or double speed. Here we go. I've pulled up the Canva presentation, so that's how you know things are getting serious. This is going to be an incredibly dense topic, so please watch this video in its entirety. In fact, this topic is so dense that I've split it up into three videos. There will be a part one, part two, and part three. Part two is coming out next week, part three the week after that. I don't want to beat around the bush. The college admissions process is an unfair game, and I want to make this point crystal clear. There's been many scandals in recent years about rich parents donating to get their kids in, racial biases towards minority groups. That being said, the sooner that you guys accept this reality, the more empowered you will feel to change the parts of your application that you have control over. Okay, great, so now that that's out of the way, I have an activity for you guys. Take a moment to jot down all the factors that you think affect your college admissions decision. Pause the video. Take a minute to do so. By the way, you guys, the reason that I prepare these activities for you is not to extend the video length time. It's because I've studied the psychology of learning and by making guesses early on, then comparing your answers to what I'm about to show you, this improves your long-term memory and retention so that the information stays with you. Sweet. So I assume by now you've written a few things down on your notepad. Let us compare lists. There it is. Take a moment to absorb it all. I am not going to insult your intelligence by reading everything on the list. As I previously mentioned, there are some things on this list that we can control, some things we cannot control, and some things that are kind of in our control. So here they are. I've split them up neatly for everyone to see. Part one is going to focus on the stuff that is not in our control. And that might sound like a weird place to start, but trust me, it will all make sense in a few more minutes. Before we get started, guys, if you could toss me a quick like, comment, subscribe, that would really help out the channel. And I really appreciate your support. All right, I think I'm just going to hang out in this bottom right corner. Cool. So things that are not in our control, they have an asterisk because each of these factors, all the 25 factors that I showed you guys on the previous slide, they don't exist in isolation. They don't exist in a box, in a cave. They have influence over each other and they are interconnected. And in fact, some of the things that you might believe you don't have control over, what this actually means is that maybe because you don't have control over where you live, what race you are, your ethnic status, that means that you might want to dedicate some more skill points to something like your GPA, your extracurriculars, awards, your initiatives, blah blah blah. Let's start with your gender slash sexual orientation. So I'm gonna offer you guys two examples where I've seen very compelling essays in which someone talked about their gender or sexual orientation and leveraged it in order to make them look more attractive to the admissions committee. The first one would be from a dear friend who is from Europe and she grew up in Amsterdam in the Netherlands and she talked about this story where as a young woman, she would be walking down the streets with her mom and she saw these old men essentially go to the red light district in Amsterdam and pay for prostitutes. And this left a deep impression on the person that she wanted to become. As a result of this story and this experience, my friend, who's a girl, ended up researching and studying law, specifically gender equity. And she talked about how this experience fueled her passion. It was a very effective essay. She got into Yale. Today, her interest in law has morphed a little bit and she wants to combine emerging technologies like AI with law in order to better optimize and promote more equity across all minority groups. Another story that I read a few years ago, and honestly, this one was a bit heartbreaking, was about a student who had been discriminated against due to their sexual orientation. I tried searching up the story, can't seem to find it these days, but I believe the student was in a major city like Chicago and kicked out of their home because they were non-binary and essentially had to fend for themselves on the streets, was homeless for a little bit. Their GPA suffered dramatically as they bounced from foster home to foster home. And so this person wrote about their experience in this story, their first two years marked with chaos, moving from place to place, never having a, a location to call home. But after studying their butt off during their junior and senior year, they were able to pull up their GPA, worked extra hard by essentially living at these libraries 
If you guys have a story similar to this one, which addresses some of the reasons why your GPA or extracurriculars might have suffered due to a personal circumstance, then you want to address those challenges in your application. The best place is probably your essays, but I guess it is possible for a teacher or a close ally to write a recommendation about your circumstances as well. When it comes to family, chances are you fit into one of the following categories, your legacy, your first gen low income, AKA FGLI, or you're somewhere in the middle. We'll just go down the list. Legacy. Everyone knows that if you have legacy, your odds of attending XYZ college improves. Question is, how much does it improve? Well, let's take a look. So I'm looking at this Guardian article published in January of 2019. And there's an interesting section here where it talks about, I mean, really this article is about um, discrimination towards Asian people, but let's take a look. It says Harvard, the acceptance rate for legacy students is about 33% compared with an overall acceptance rate of under 6%. You know, guys, I get it. Some of you are thinking this is totally unfair. Why is this even the case? According to this article by The Atlantic, it argues that the most important rationale for colleges to admit legacy kids is a financial one. They tend to believe that giving legacy applicants an edge helps them bring in alumni donations. A few paragraphs down though, it also says that this is statistically <laughs> just untrue. From 1980 to 2010, they accepted far fewer legacy students, and yet alumni giving increased. Basically guys, the takeaway here is if you're legacy, good for you. If you're not legacy, let's discuss how to work your angles. Now, something that a lot of students don't know is that FGLI students are viewed very attractively in the college admissions process. Schools like Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Princeton, really any top 20 college, even any state school wants to admit underprivileged students. And they're looking for those kids who didn't have the best resources and yet they persevered and excelled given their circumstances. Colleges want you. If you're legacy or if you're FGLI, you actually have an edge over the average middle-class American. I have another article pulled up. I love my articles. This one's by College Vine. Being first gen is unlikely to hurt your chances. In fact, it may attract the attention of admissions officers and your application may be viewed more positively. Colleges will be more willing to forgive lower grades, test scores, or extracurricular involvements because they know that if you're busy working another job to support your family, you may have much more challenging circumstances than the average US high school student. Further on, this article talks about if you have a spectacular academic extracurricular record, this is likely to especially impress admissions officers. That kind of hard work is something every college values. Nice. The people I feel the worst for, the most sorry for, are those folks in the middle. It's really tough. Like if you're FGLI or legacy, then you don't even have to worry about the financial aspect of college because your legacy, you're likely in the top one, two percent of America, or if you're FGLI, you'll qualify for a full scholarship like me. The folks in the middle, I think, are getting squeezed by colleges, especially tuition rates that have just been growing year after year nonstop. What are your options as a middle-class American applying to these top colleges? How will you stand out? Okay, so the first is, can you apply to a summer program at Dream College? Honestly, this is a great tip for everyone, but I think that the folks in the middle have to do an especially good job at arguing why they want to attend their dream college. So another factor that you guys saw previously is college interest level. Some schools care about it a lot. Some schools don't care about it at all. Just be sure to research your school in particular and see what they care about. But doing a summer program and being able to explain that you lived in the dorm, you've seen the community, you like the architecture, that really helps. I did a summer program at Cornell and it was viewed very, very highly. I got a recommendation from my teacher. I was taking a course in business and I'm sure that really helped propel my application when it came to applying to Ivy League schools. You can also do this really early on when you're a ninth grader or 10th grader. It's a little bit tougher to do one of these programs in your 11th grade year because it is almost viewed as application padding. So recommended timeline is to do this between 9th to 10th grade summer or 10th to 11th grade summer. Another option is can you do research? at the nearest Ivy or like top 20 school. If you are a prospective STEM major and you conduct research with any professor, it doesn't even have to be at a top 20 school. It could be the nearest college to you. It could be your state school. You will stand out in your application. It's very rare for high schoolers to have this kind of research experience. And while some of you might be watching this video right now and thinking, Kevin, there's no way I'm so underqualified. Everyone is underqualified until they do the job. So your assignment is, again, during that summer, 10th to 11th grade, 11th to 12th grade, if you have not emailed 50 to 100 professors, worked a connection, you have a friend of a friend, you have a family member who maybe knows an employee at one of these institutions, guys, 
work those connections, pick up the phone, do a cold call, email people. By the way, it usually takes four to six emails on average, cold emails for someone to respond to your message. I would make this a priority because all you need is for one of those people to say yes. And you can go and intern, uh, conduct research, act as an assistant to the lab for six weeks. And it looks amazing on your resume and on, on your college application. If you're one of those folks in the middle, guys, you seriously need to go out in the world and make opportunities happen. You can't just sit around waiting for them to fall on you. Next up on the list is geographical residence. I mentioned this point last week, I don't want to berate it, but I was very surprised to learn that Exeter, the District of Columbia, Indiana, and Japan, all four of these locations send about 10 students to Yale every single year. It's pretty mind blowing. I actually want to say that China sends about 10 people to Yale as undergraduates every single year as well. Let me, let me really break this down for you guys, because at a school like Exeter, it means that your competition is way more fierce if you want to apply to an Ivy League school. Technically speaking, your odds are better, but let's say you live in a state like Indiana or Wisconsin or South Dakota. If you apply to Yale, not a lot of people are doing that. So you stand out immediately. Unfortunately, if you're in a more crowded state like Massachusetts, California, Illinois, Florida, those states send a lot of kids to Ivies every single year. The reason is because these states have a very high quality of, of education at the public school level. And what colleges want to see is your ability to take advantage of the circumstances that were presented before you. This is an extremely key point. Let me write it down. It's so important. Colleges take into consideration how you leveraged the opportunities presented before you. You guys need to know this. College admissions officers don't compare private boarding school students like me to someone who's applying from a public school in Whitefish, Montana. They would never ever do that. There are admissions officers for certain regions. There are even admissions officers for certain schools. For instance, Exeter and Andover, they have their own admissions officers who are more familiar with the GPA. Exeter runs on an 11.0 GPA scale. Like that's comparing apples to oranges if you were like a public school student, it makes no sense. What's going on through the college admissions officer's mind is, okay, you're from Whitefish, Montana and your school offered five APs. You took every single AP and you did exceptionally well on them. Not only that, but you started an initiative and you really took advantage of everything your school, your district, had to offer. If you go to a school like Exeter or even a really great public school in California, uh, Chicago, or like Jefferson High School, I think that's in Virginia, and you didn't take 10, 12 APs, but your school offers 20 APs, suddenly you look really lazy. By the same logic, if you're an international student and English is your second language and you had to work really, really hard in order to study for the ACT and take your APs and all that kind of thing, college admissions officers know that. So don't feel discouraged. Oh no, only five people from my state go to Harvard or Yale every single year. No guys, don't be discouraged. Kevin wants you to have faith in yourself. I believe in you. Yeah? Oh, they want something fun on that. Actually, we'll pause the tape here. Friends, I'm back for the final session. I had to go downstairs to eat some dinner. Tonight we had pan fried dumplings, which really hit that sweet spot. Ugh, I miss those. Let's finish up this video by talking about the spiciest subject of all, your racial slash ethnic status. When it comes to this factor, I have two recommendations, two options. You can either embrace it fully or fight it. What I'm about to say is incredibly controversial advice, so please take this with a grain of salt and think for yourself. Feel free to agree or disagree. I won't be offended. The best way to illustrate race in college admissions is probably through some specific examples. Okay, so let's say you are a Chinese American and you love math. You fulfill that nerdy stereotype, really, really good at math. Maybe you guys did math counts in middle school. Now my question for you is, are you a baby goat? Are you going to become the greatest of all time, perhaps enter the top 0.1% of mathematicians? If so, then I would recommend going all in. Being a part of the US Math Olympiad team is no easy feat. If you have done that, great fully embrace the stereotype, talk about math, maybe you wrote a math textbook or a physics textbook. Sounds crazy, but I know people from Exeter who did win medals at the Math Olympiad and who also wrote textbooks. Yes, I'm not making that up. Still, I would advise you to direct your passion for math towards helping others. Maybe you start a tutoring service, maybe you created a YouTube channel. That would be fantastic. Really hammer that edge home. Let's say you are not a Chinese American math prodigy. 
In this scenario, you should swim against the current. I wouldn't go so far as to say do traditionally non-Chinese American related things, but let's say you have a real passion for writing or architecture, things that are not typically associated with the Chinese stereotype. Fantastic, work that into your edge. I'll share a little bit of a personal anecdote. I used to be really good at piano. I would say I was probably in the top 1% of the US at piano. I played 10 years of classical piano during my senior year. I gave a recital, it was one hour long. I memorized the whole thing, very proud of that feat. But that wasn't my edge. I didn't want to hammer that home in my application. Sure, it was one dimension, it showed my discipline, but really my edge was international relations and writing. If you guys are confused about what an edge means, please check out this video. Truth be told, I made a conscious decision to emphasize writing over piano. During my junior year, I had an option if I wanted to focus more on writing or if I wanted to invest more in piano, did I want to put my energy and effort towards other leadership positions at school. Of course, I wanted to maintain my piano practice, so I still tried to fit an hour to two hours every single day. But I knew that my edge would be focused on writing and international relations, and so they ended up becoming higher priorities on the totem pole. There is that concept of the dash that I also mentioned in my previous video. So I'm a piano player, dash breakdancer, dash global affairs, enthusiast. But don't forget that the edge is really one of the most crucial things in your application. You do want to highlight it. Your chances will significantly go up if you're able to say, this is my key area of interest. Here is some proof that I take this seriously and that I have seen some success in this area. <laughs> okay, second example. Let's say you're Indian American and you love medicine, you like coding. Again, can you become part of the top 0.1% in your field? Have you won international awards for this subject? Have you made some kind of crazy discovery? Let's say you love medicine and you're in the top 10% or the top 20%. You, you do want to go to med school and this is your life's calling, but you haven't won those crazy awards. What I would recommend is going back to that idea of an initiative. Can you combine medicine with another passion like education or the sports or the outdoors? Let me just drum up some examples. You could start a project where you go around teaching kids in your local neighborhood about first aid and how to prevent serious injuries. First, third degree burns, um, you know, tourniquets, that sort of thing. Or you're interested in sports and medicine, the intersection of those two topics. You might intern at your local professional sports league or with a team. Let's say you're really interested in medicine and the outdoors. So you do Boy Scouts, perhaps you end up talking about all these different herbs that have medicinal properties and you end up educating younger students and teaching them that information. Let's say you're Indian American and you love something that is very stereotypically non-Indian American. Let's say you're into fashion or history. Drill down guys and turn that into your niche. Hammer that point home in your application. Now the other thing to consider is can you become a goat in your niche? And the answer is yeah, you can. In fact, it's probably easier to be in the top 1% of history or fashion than it is to become in the top 1% in medicine. Generally speaking, for 90% of students, it's going to be beneficial to find your niche ASAP and figure out a way where you can showcase not just your passion, but that you've met significant success in your niche. In conclusion, my number one takeaway for all you goobers watching today is that yes, there are factors that are not in our control, but we have a lot more agency than you think. There's that saying, right, where you can't control the hands that you've been dealt, but you can choose how you want to play that hand, right? Is that, is that how the saying goes? Someone fact check me on that. And I know it sounds really cheesy, but if you're watching this as an 8th grader or a ninth grader or a 10th grader, even if you're in 11th or 12th grade and it's getting a little bit late in the college application process, trust me when I say that your chances are a lot better than you think. I know this sounds like self-promotion, but really go through and watch my videos because I don't think that kids are getting rejected because they're bad applicants. I think they're, get, they're getting, blah, blah, blah. I think that they're getting rejected or waitlisted or whatever because they don't know how to apply. They don't understand the rules of the game. As soon as you understand the rules of the game, it becomes a lot more clear. Can you imagine trying to play chess or checkers without knowing how the pieces move? It's impossible. Of course you'll lose. Do yourself a favor and get educated about how the college admissions process works. Honestly though, if you spent an hour and a half reading those College Vine articles, watching YouTube videos about the college admissions process for a year, you would know so much more than the average college applicant because they start way too late. I'm telling you guys, 95% of applicants start their junior summer, senior fall. I wish, I wish they had started just six months earlier. Do your future self a favor and give yourself a head start. Part two and part three, we'll talk about the things that are sort of in our control and the things that are definitely in our control. <laughs> now that I look at it again, the in our control section is hella long. So I might have to make this 
Should I split this up again? Ugh. At any rate, I hope you guys enjoyed today's broadcast. I'll be back with another video on Monday. I upload twice a week. Please share this information with your friends. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. If I missed any factors that you guys thought of that I haven't, let me know in the comment section below. Or if you have any questions about this video, I respond to every single comment, guys. My channel is the size of a microbe. So I take all of your commentary, criticism, and feedback very seriously. That concludes today's video. As always, guys, keep it real and do you. Peace. If you've made it to the end of the video, I have some bonus footage for you. Here's a clip of me breakdancing in Queens this past weekend. Enjoy! <laughs> Let's go, let's go, clap your hands and make some noise.